Navigating the road to success in the entertainment industry can be daunting, but we're here to help keep you centered. Undetoured, navigating the artist's journey. My next guest is a renowned Atlanta comedian. Mark Kendall uses comedy to encourage civil engagement. He's had four short films screened at the American Black Comedy Film Festival. He's toured nationally with his one-person show, The Magic Negro and Other Blackness. He's the reader's pick for Best Comedian from Atlanta in 2019. He and his partner, Bill Worley, run Cool 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 Productions, which if you haven't gotten a chance to check their work out yet, jump over to Instagram at Mark Kendall Comedy to check it out. Let's drop in on the conversation I had with him late last year. I don't know if you knew this, but 37.2 trillion cells make up the human body. And they did not waste one moment as they worked in concert with my next guest, Mark Kendall. Absolutely brilliant, brilliant, civil, engaging storyteller, comedian, stand-up comedian, improviser, and now making some of the most brilliant videos I've ever seen. Welcome, Mark Kendall. Thanks so much. I appreciate the kind words. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, I am so excited to talk to you because, first of all, we've actually worked together. And believe it or not, when I was thinking back about it, it was kind of a socially engaged piece that we worked on that uh, we did, uh, Homeless Hipsters, back in the day. Um, and I just remember about you that your energy and your charisma is so so engaging like you just people gravitate to you has this happened all your life like when you were a kid kids just wanted to be friends with you oh uh you know i don't know i don't think so <laughs> i don't know maybe i don't know but i think it's uh performance is maybe a little different than like junior high you know so yeah. So when you were a kid, you know, if we think back to when you were a child back in the sandbox, did you always know you wanted to be a storyteller? Or is this something that you came to later in life? Oh, no, it was definitely later in, in life. Like, I didn't really do any, um, I mean, aside from, you know, the school mandated plays, like when you're younger, I, I didn't really do any performance until like towards the end of college, like, um, because uh, I went to school, I studied uh, film and uh, I joined a sketch group in college, but I started out as like a crew person and writing and, and, and my, my whole thing was about being behind the scenes. Like I didn't have much interest in performing. And then the summer before my uh, senior year in college, I did this program at Comedy Central. It was, like the, it was called the Chris Rock Comedy Central Summer School. And so what it was, it was, it wasn't exactly like an internship. It's like you submitted a writing sample or samples, and then uh, you spent a summer in New York and like Comedy Central would like rotate you through different departments to kind of like expose you to different writing jobs. So it's like, so for example, like, I don't even remember what the department was called, but they had like a blog, for example, they used to. And so like, you'd write an article or, or like you'd go to development and it's like, you develop the pitch or you oh, so it was the, like a round robin just to see like which areas you might be interested in later on in life right precisely yeah and so um um then uh the 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 cool part of the program was i got to spend a week uh shadowing the writers of the colbert report and then i got to spend a week uh shadowing the writers of the daily show with john stewart so you get to um you know sit in on pitch meetings and like um Meanwhile, you'd be like working on your own stuff. And the big takeaway from that experience was like being able to pitch is like a different skill than like writing something on paper and like learning how to write something that's like meant for someone to be said aloud later that day is different than like writing like a script, you know? Um, and what I learned was in both of those writing staffs, like in addition to being writers, all the people on staff, nearly all of them, either were like excellent performers or had like some sort of performance experience. Um, and so my roommate at the time of the program, who was also doing the program with me, um, he, and he was, and because we were living in New York that summer, which has all these open mics, I just kind of started following him to open mics as a way to learn how to like pitch jokes. And I was like, oh, this is fun. And um, uh, the school I went to was in a suburb of Chicago. So when I went back to college for that senior year. Uh, I took like my first improv class. And so when I started improv, it was more so from a perspective of like, oh, this is how I can like inform my writing. So if I have to be in a writer's room and pitch again, 
it's not as uncomfortable, you know, like, so, so that's kind of where. Well, let's get to that. Let's get to that. So what makes us, you know, as storytellers, we have so much to say, right? We have so much that's on our hearts. And I feel like we're all kind of empaths in a way. We, we feel so much. We feel what's going on in the world around us. And in return, we're able to, you know, mirror that on camera if we're on camera actors with our voices. If we're voice actors, obviously as writers, we're able to just mirror what's going on in society. But let's get to like the feeling of that icky feeling of like, am I worthy of having mm -hmm. my stories told or having my voice heard? Did you go through that feeling during that time? And how did you, you know, get past that? Yeah, I think that's something that like comes and goes. Like, I don't know if that ever really goes away. Meaning like, where you're just like, oh, why should I be on stage doing this? Or like, why should I be making so you whatever don't feel it is? like you're worthy now even? You don't feel like you're worthy now to be on as a stand-up comedian or? Oh, well, I think it comes in cycles. So, I mean, yeah. like, I think on a deeper level, like, I'm pretty sure I know more the otherwise I don't think you'd ever get up on stage if you really really thought that um but I think that you know maybe you're working out some new material or trying to figure out like what you want to say next and as you're in that process of developing something new you're like oh do I have the right to say this thing and uh I think that that's not necessarily a bad place to be because maybe that just means like oh you just need to develop whatever you're working on more and I think that oftentimes like you know where my confidence comes from in battling that is like, well, have I rewritten this enough times? Have I gone up and performed this enough times? And then because I've put that time into it, I'm like, oh yes, I, I am worthy to do this because I've, I've worked at this. But like maybe earlier on in the process, when you haven't worked through those thoughts or you haven't put in that time, I think, you know, those fears of like, oh, am I, am I in a place to talk about this? And you might not yet be because it needs more time. And do you go through any rituals before you go up on stage or before you go into like a situation like an improv uh, show? Do you have any rituals that you kind of do? Do you meditate? Do you stay anywhere like quiet or you just kind of like go for it? I don't think I have any like rituals, meaning th there's nothing that I feel like I need to do. Otherwise, I'm like, oh, I'm not going to have a good show. Um, there are some things that I do more often than not. So um I think like with stand up, for example, just to, I don't always do this, but, but like, depending on the type of show it is, like if it's a show where I'm trying to write and develop material, I try to make a point of making sure that I record the set um, just so I can have something to kind of go back to and listen to. And I try to re-listen to that as soon as possible. That's not so much like a, that's not so much about the performance. I guess that's more about like afterwards. Um, but no, I don't know if I have any like rituals really in terms of like what I do um, before going up on stage. Huh? So when you were younger, let's just go all the way back to the sandbox. Cause when we're younger, we jump in, we play. Did you have, did you feel like at that point in time, you just, did you have any inkling that you would be a storyteller that you would be doing this for a living at all? And was there support on your parents' side to help you with that? Yeah, I think growing up, no, I don't think I really thought, um, well, I, I guess uh, it, it did change. I mean, like as a kid, no, um, but I think in high school, I, I was like, oh, I really like filmmaking and I like people that write and direct their own pieces. So I think that was in high school when that started to shift and I was like, oh, okay, I, I, I may not really miss detailed, but it's just like, I think Spike Lee is cool and I wanna do what he does. Because it was at it was at a time like uh, in the early and mid two thousands, like you had DVD commentary, but there weren't like podcasts yet, if that makes sense. So like Spike Lee, he had these books. I don't know if you remember these books that he came out with like early on, where he would like publish a book that went along with his movies, and he did it for like at least his first five films, I know, and it was really cool. It was kind of like a production journal, and he was very like transparent and forthcoming very candid, about yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I think later we got more of that with like DVD commentaries and like more behind the scenes stuff that exists now. But at the time it was like really cool to have access to this person that was like, I tried to make this movie. This is what was easy. This is what was difficult. And then you could read the script. He'd also inc include the script. And then you could go watch the movie and like compare and contrast those notes. I forget how I got on that tangent. No, but, it's oh, so yes. awesome. So no, that, it's so awesome. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, because yeah, I mean, yeah, but- failure is part of it. And so someone as big as Spike Lee and how influential he's been for the filmmaking industry in, in general, but especially for black filmmakers, is it's so important for him to say, listen, I failed at this. I got back up. I did it again because that's the thing as storytellers, I feel like a lot of people and maybe some people who are listening are feeling they're like, I don't know if I can get back up again. I've tried so much and, you know, I just don't know if I can get back up that one last time, but he's a true testament to that, so. Yeah, yeah, so I, I think, so I, I learned a lot from that and um, and I think that was around the time, like middle of high school is when I started to get, um, you know, really into like, filmmaking and, and the writing aspect of things and being like, okay, this is what I would want to do. That, uh, But like, I think in my mind, that's kind of like, discover that a little bit later towards towards high school yeah wow that's that's truly amazing and do you feel like now that you have been able to have the autonomy of your own content where you've written it produced it and um, put it out there for the masses that you're at a um, more comfortable space Space to be authentic with what you want to tell, like, or do you still feel like you're trying to, um, you know, appeal to the masses or, or, you know, you know, there's a fine line for comedians. Like you, you have your truth. You're, and I've heard you've done this, that you've gone off on tangents, uh, improv parts of your show where you've had a scripted yeah. part, but you've gone off on improv because you wanted to kind of feel it out and really, really give your truth. And it's so important for us to be able to do that as storytellers, but so many of us feel scared to do that so do you feel like you're coming more into that now or um you know it's interesting like um uh maybe in some ways not so i guess what i mean by that is um i feel like sometimes and not that this is a good thing sometimes i feel more self-conscious on video versus uh, like a live piece because you know you put out a video and then it it kind of stays that one thing. And so uh, depending on the subject matter, I just want to be, it makes me feel like, it makes me want to be more careful. Sometimes that may not be the best thing uh, creatively. Whereas like, uh, whereas if I'm doing a, a live show or something and I go off on this weird tangent and maybe I do the wrong thing or I say the wrong thing, in that moment, I can be like, oh, that was weird. I can say out loud, like that was a weird moment we experienced this wrong thing. I'm sorry about that. But you don't really get to do that with the video. And um, and so I guess I'm just learning what the video version of that is, you know, because it's like when, you, when you're performing live and you go to a strange place, it's like you can, you can cut, you're doing that with the audience a little bit more. So, I mean, you could even ask the audience in a set like, oh, y'all are kind of nice. Can we go to this weird place? And they can kind of tell you like yes or no, whereas in a video it doesn't really work like that. And so um, I found that, at least right now, I'm sort of like, okay, how can I not so much give extra context, but how can I, or, or even not, not that I'm like too obsessed with like clarity or context, but it's just like, how can I put something out there where it's just like, even if it gets misunderstood, like I'm still okay with what I said. You know, so. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, uh, and we've seen this a lot lately, comedians, you know, putting information out there that now is coming back to haunt them, especially with, um, you know, the Me Too movement or any kind of movement around LGBTQA+, um, and, and now also, you know, it's very important to recognize what we went through, like as a whole humanity, what we just went through, two things, two major things, not only just the pandemic, but just the racial reckoning that we went through in 2020 and how that, I think that really, really like sparked something in you. I, I saw like just a total shift in your content and your social engagement, like went way up. And I feel like it went back to like what you were um, creatively inspired by, by the Colbert Report and all those, because those are very socially engaging shows. So you kind of went back to your roots there. And I just want you to talk about kind of like, 
what you felt in that beginning of the pandemic where a you could not do improv anymore you could not do stand up like your voice was literally not be able you know not being able to be heard how did that how did that how did you sit with that and do you have roommates so you were even able to talk to someone or were you alone in your house or, you know, i know you're not married but you know like tell me how that yeah. felt yeah it was it was a strange time uh obvious obviously especially in the very beginning cuz i don't think or at least I didn't, and the people around me didn't know how long this. No, no one knew. Was no gonna one, we're be. still in yeah. it. We're still right, in it. Yeah. Like, how yeah. the hell did it happen this long? Like, how are we yeah. still here? Yeah. So, so that was that was part of it. Where I remember early on, and I was doing like virtual shows, and my feeling when I was doing the virtual shows was kind of just like, oh, here's this weird little thing that I'll do for like a couple weeks, maybe like a month, and then I think. You know, things got especially weird when it's like, oh, this could, we don't know how, we just don't know how long this is going to go. And, um, and yeah, there was no live performance of any kind, or at least I was not, you know, performing live. And um, no, there was nothing. Was really, I mean, everything shut down in Atlanta here, at least. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so it was a, it was a strange, it was a strange time, of course. Uh, and um, it was, it was a, you know, for me, I guess for me, in terms of performance, for me, it was a weird shift because before that, I'd probably been performing more than I ever had at any point, probably, you know, like I was- So you were on a high, you were like stage. in the flow, you were in your flow at that point. Very much, like like I was in a flow, I was doing like a lot of stand up and, um, and I felt pretty good about it. And then when the live performance uh, stopped, it was very interesting because I think, you know, other performers probably felt or went through something similar where it's just like, oh, here's this thing that like took up a lot of my time, like all of my time. And, and now it's not really something that I'm able to do in the way that I used to do it before. And then I was like, oh, you know, that's part of how I define myself. So, so like, if I'm not performing live and that's what I did all the time, what do I, like, what, it, like, you know what I mean? Like, what's that mean? Uh, and so, I was fortunate in that I was able to stay indoors. Like I, 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 you know, meaning like, you know, I was, I was able to, I was able to quarantine, you know, and, and um, I use that time to like reflect a lot. So uh, I did the artist way for a second time. I, I did it love once the like, artist like, way. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, amazing. So I, yeah. I love it. It's so yeah. great. Everyone should do the artist way. Here's a plug for yeah. artist way. Everyone should do it because <laughs> I, yeah. I wrote a script. I wrote, wrote a feature film that's in development now because of the artist way. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I, I did it the first time, maybe like eight or so years ago. And I thought it was really helpful. Uh, I think it helped me develop a lot in terms of uh, figuring out what I wanted out of like my creative life and, and because, and it had been a long time and I had, even before the pandemic, I felt like I was in this rut. Like, even though I was performing a lot, I was just like, but why am I doing this? Like, where am I going with it? And I wasn't really sure, like what I was like working up to it was, it was kind of in, I think other people that I've talked to maybe have felt something similar where we're busying ourselves with all these things, but it's just like, ultimately, like, what's it kind of leading up to? Yeah, and that's in, so in, important in the, that you said that, like busying ourselves mm -hmm. with so many things, but what is the ultimate, like, what are we here to do on earth? Like, what's your highest soul's path? And like you, your highest soul's path, like was kind of ripped away from you and then you had to reinvent it. And like, what does that look like? Yeah, yeah. Well, but be be before, at the start of 2020, I had um, made a decision to like write down every performance that I did. So um, just to be like, where's my time going? So, so I wrote down like all these shows that I've been doing. So I wrote down like, was this a sketch show? Was this an improv show? Was this a stand-up show? Was this a booked showcase? Was this an open mic? Was it paid? Was it... I also would write down like descriptors about like how the show made me feel. Like, did I feel energized by it? Did I hate the experience? And so then when everything kind of shut down, I had like this spreadsheet of all these shows that I had done for the first three months of the year. And I was just, and, I, and when I looked through it, I was just like, oh, a lot of these uh, shows, I, while I was thankful to do them and I do like performing, a lot of them were like empty experiences. And really? I think that- So you felt drained yeah, afterwards. Uh, from a lot of them, yeah. And, and I think I was doing this because I 
felt like I had to do them. And, um, and that's not all wrong. You know what I mean? Like, like, I mean, I, I, like I am compelled to perform and that's in itself, like not a bad thing, but I think that there was something missing in what I was like going out to do in those performances. For, like, for example, like, um, I think that like, I kind of, um, uh, like with some of the stand-up shows that I was doing when I was sheets, old shows and things, I was just like, oh, on these shows, like I didn't really get anything out of it because I didn't really like push myself to try something new. Instead, I think I was just trying to do well on the show, meaning like sometimes you can be on a stand-up show where maybe people have paid money to see a ticket. Uh, maybe you're being paid to perform, you know? Uh, so you um, don't take as many risks as you probably could. Uh, just to make sure that you deliver a certain quality performance. But in doing that, you're not really like pushing yourself or stretching yourself. And then if you go on a string of those performances like that, or you do a string of shows like that, it's just like, you've done all these shows, but you haven't really like grown at all. You haven't really like taken any risks. And it's not coming from a bad place. And it isn't even necessarily coming from a place of fear. You're just trying to like you're supposed to do, which is like do the best show you know how and I was just like oh I think I got like there's like a fear of not a fear of failure but it's just like a fear of like a certain quality of risk taking you know um I don't know and so, so like that was one thing that I noticed um uh but yeah I think that doing the artist way again during the summer um or yeah during the summer of 2020 um I also did it with my friend Bill Worley and so Bill Worley is the person that um directs shoots, edits, like all the videos that all the I put out. Wow. Yeah, and, and the reason that that was so amazing, I mean, in addition to him being like a great collaborator, friend, filmmaker, uh, what's unique about Bill is that he does all of those things very well. Like, and it doesn't seem like that's possible, but it is. And so um, we had shot, and I realized I may be jumping around a little bit. No, but, I love it. But, great. Yeah, but like one of the last weekends before everything shot, shut down, we shot uh, a video. So uh, Bill and I have known each other for like, you know, I don't know, probably like 10 years just from doing comedy and things like that. But uh, towards the end of 2019, I had done a stage show with my friend John Mangan called Magic and Bird. And it was like this ridiculous, silly show where he was Larry Bird, I was Magic Johnson, and we did a stage play about their fictionalized rivalry. And it was just bonkers. It was like, it, it was like this very, I mean, it makes, it makes us laugh a lot. It was actually a very fun experience. Like I was Magic Johnson, he was Larry Bird. And it was like, a, like a, what's it called? A sports documentary, but on stage. So like, it. but it was like a fictionalized version of their rivalry. So like um, we started where it's like, we documented their rise in the NBA and their rivalry, but then they have to come together when they find out that Michael Jordan is actually a robot that has been sent to kill the president during the 1992 Dream Team Olympics. So then we pair up and it's like, then it turns into like a buddy cop drama, I guess, or a buddy mystery, a, a bromance where we take down Michael Jordan. It is bonkers. And I'm a fan of Michael Jordan. I don't think he's a killer, but it's just like, it, that's what it was. Anyway, Bill Worley directed the video pieces that we did for it. Cause it was like a force documentary. So we'd do a couple scenes and then you'd cut to the screen and there'd be a fake Larry Bird, Magic Johnson commercial. Or we'd do a couple scenes and we'd cut to like talking heads of different NBA players talking about Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. This experience was fun was working with Bill. And I was like, hey, Bill, would you ever want to um, collaborate on some more videos? Because for, for years I've been wanting to uh, do more video work, but it's tough because it's just like, uh, Oh, wait, I, heard, I, I, did, I missed you there. You kind of cut froze. There. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay. You said um, you wanted to work with him for years, but it's what? Oh, I, I wanted to make comedic videos for a long time, but it's tough to find people to uh, partner with because like a filmmaker might be a good filmmaker, a comedian might be a good comedian, but their styles don't match. And uh, uh, one of the things that, I noticed right away about Bill, in addition to his ability to do so many things, his editing is like next level. And he has the unique ability to edit comedy, 
um because you need timing to it um so that jokes don't get lost and um his ability to edit comedy is like next level so anyway one of the last weekends before everything shut down uh he and i shot a piece from my um solo show that i'd had for a number of years about Marta moving to Cobb County. And then like a couple of weeks later, everything shut down. And we were just kind of like sitting on this video for months, you know, cause we were just like, no one's riding the train right now. Like, why are we putting out like a video about public train? Uh, but then uh, June, June of 2020 hit. And it was just like, I don't know. I feel like this video brings up like, certain ish like it, it it talks about it, it's uh it neighbors upon certain issues that are being that were being talked about at the time yeah and let's uh, not dance around that i mean we can be completely honest here there was a lot going on in the world at that time yeah and it's and mm -hmm. for you especially like as a performer in atlanta and i know i don't know if you were at it but we had a racial reckoning um town hall um that addressed a lot of the systemic racism that were microaggressions and macroaggressions towards BIPOC community within even our ecosystem of creating theater and I was so so blown away and, and saddened and it's just there, of course along with everything else in the world too right like all all of the other terrible things that were going on and um, so yeah, that's that's got to feel for you extremely like vulnerable to be able to kind of put that out there and brave too to put something like out there that was comedic, you know, during a time that so much was so disparaging. Yeah. So uh, summer of 2020, obviously, like you know, understatement. It was a wild time uh, for everyone, and when uh, you know. Uh, the George Floyd uh, stuff went down. It, I was also in the fifth week of the artist way, or I forget which week, but it was a week where um, you're supposed to try and stay in, away from like reading and news and email and all those things. Obviously, I did not do that, <laughs> but 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 um, but I was trying my best to. And I remember it was like uh, I don't know if it made things better or worse. I I don't know. It, it was weird, but but it was it, it was definitely like this. Um, strange time where uh, I don't know was, I think everything was just like uh, uh, I don't know what I don't know how to say it like like um, uh, it's I'm trying to remember back to uh, what it was like at that time but I, I think one thing that I do kind of remember was having the uh, uh, the ability to kind of like dive into those videos was really helpful you know so um oh, it's such a uh, traumatic experience as a bystander even to be a part of the energy that was mm -hmm. going on in 2020 i mean mm -hmm. and i can't even imagine how you felt you know mm -hmm. i you know as a bystander just being me and i'm like a white jewish little girl you know in a suburb of atlanta that doesn't have any aspect of what what happened to all these amazing people for no no good reason at all but for you you know as a creator and as a black man i mean it's so so much more intense because it could happen to you anytime you could be driving down the road and be stopped for no reason and that yeah i mean that's gotta in a way your body almost has to block some of that feeling you were having issues remembering it and i think it's because your mind wants to blot some of it out right uh, uh, perhaps, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, for sure. I, I think um, uh, definitely at the time, I think something that was really helpful was being able to write and, and, and being able to make content. And so I wasn't able to perform, obviously, but, um, but making the videos with Bill was definitely like uh, a really helpful outlet because you could put so much of everything into that. And, um, yeah, and your energy went towards something that was positive, like that was yeah. uplifting, mm -hmm. positive, you know, comedic, which is what we needed at that point in time. We all needed that so much because there's, yeah, it was so heavy. Yeah, and so I, I felt like that was really helpful at the time. And so like thinking back, you know, back to, you know, when I was going down like, you know, nearly a year and a half ago, I definitely remember, you know, 
even if it wasn't necessarily creative writing, I, I just remember journaling like a ton, <laughs> you know, I, I just, I just would like just be doing that all the time. And, um, and that was very useful to have that. Yeah. And so in the journaling, was it stream of consciousness that you were doing, like based on what was going on in the news or stream of consciousness of like how you were feeling or was it these ideas for the shows? It was mostly stream of consciousness of just like feelings as well as like some prompts from the artist's way. And then also just trying to unpack like uh, a, like certain experiences that might be happening at that time. And just trying to under like, and just trying to write about it through journaling, and then also strangely, like I think at that time, I called more people on the phone. I think at that time because I'm used to, you know, you know, before the pandemic, I see a lot of people regularly from doing shows and performances and things, and so I also um, made an effort via Zoom or via phone call to like have conversations with friends and things like that in a way that maybe I hadn't before because before I would have been like oh well I'll see you next weekend and you would and you, you talk like before after a show we take whereas, advantage we we ha you know take it for granted that we're gonna mm -hmm. get to do all the things that we love to do and when it's taken away from us it really kind of gives you this introspective thing of wow my voice really does matter it could be taken away at any point my life could be taken away at any point and so what am I here on this earth to do and to create and what is my highest soul's path? So I have to ask you, what are you here on this earth to do? What's your highest soul's path? Like what's your ultimate goal? That's a great question. I'm, I think I'm still uh, figuring out what that is because I mean, meaning like, you know, I love writing, I love performing, I love doing it comedically, you know, um, and I love like trying to find a way to you know, express whatever it is that I'm feeling to like another person that may not necessarily understand. So it's like, if I have like a weird thought in my head or a weird feeling in my head, if I can find a way to articulate it to where it's just like, oh, I've been able to communicate whatever it is that I'm expressing, that's great. But I'm still trying to figure out what that means like on a broader level. So beyond just like, oh, expressing myself, like, well, larger than that, like, what does that really mean? Or more so like, connected to a community or to other people, what's that really mean? I think part of the reason why it's tough for me to phrase that sometimes is because like there's just been so much change with how like my relationship with performance as well as media over the past like year and a half, two years, or even over the past like 10, 15 years, you know, because like I feel like as a kid when I was like watching Spike Lee movies, it's like, oh, if you wanna do what Spike Lee does, you go out, you make like an independent film. And it's just like, that still exists, but not in the way that it did when he was making them. So it's just like, what Spike Lee's doing now might be like a, like a TikTok today or, you know, like an Instagram account today. And so just kind of figuring out like what, what I enjoy um, making, I'm, I'm still learning because I'm still experimenting with, with, with different things with that makes sense so no I love that you say you're still learning because I oh, feel cool. like if storytellers we're always still learning like I'm in class four days a week I you know try to um just try to learn 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 as much as you can because it takes I think Sandy Meisner said it takes 20 years to be an actor and you know you're doing storytelling from the aspect of writing producing you know acting everything so you have so much growth to still you know, be seen. I, I'm just so excited to see what we're going to see from you next. <laughs> oh, fun. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. I'm, um, yeah, I think, um, it, uh, I'm still learning how to articulate like what, what it is that like I'm trying to do with the comedy on a broader level. And part of it is like still discovering what's possible. So by that, I mean, like, for example, uh, you know, Bill and I started making these videos and we we're able to grow kind of like an online audience for them and we we're like okay this has good momentum so we formed a production company and uh in order to specifically like partner with clients or other partners uh to make things on like a more official basis i suppose so we've had the opportunity to partner with some really great folks like fair count for example has been like a really great organization that we've been able to make content um 
for the New Georgia Project, you know, um, out of hand theater, uh, for example, and, and we hope to continue to work with more folks. And, and what's been interesting with that, with, with partnerships like that is, you know, we did, like, for example, we did some redistricting videos for Fair Count and, you know, we pitched them ideas, but then they also shared their research with us on redistricting and, and, and like uh, what it was all about, um, how to reach people uh, when talking about those topics. And then we were able to provide like, like our joke telling or our storytelling, whatever, and kind of merge it with the resources that they had. And that experience to me was like, it felt more productive than me, like going on stage and like talking about redlining, you know what I mean? Like, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but what I liked about this was it was like, oh, this is a deliberate partnership where there are people that are working on this issue. And then we're like partnering with them to use uh, comedy to try and like forward that conversation. Yeah, I think that's such an important thing that you touched on is being able to find strategic partnerships. And this is like part of actionable steps that I think any listener can really kind of like be writing notes down about because actionable steps like this that form partnerships that create social engagement or create some way of the normal public being able to, you know, um, take it in in a bite-sized piece that's funny and palatable and, and then think about it and be like, oh, oh crap. Yeah, this is really going on. Oh, I didn't know this was going on or you know even your last one with the vaccine I love oh yeah I love that one it's so fun because it's like oh you know it's people are still haven't gotten vaccinated yet and it's like hello we're (sighs) anyway um I'm not gonna go into that but um yeah, so I think it's wonderful that you've created that actionable step for people and letting people know that strategic partnerships and did they come to you because they saw your content or did you go to them and like make the first introduction like, hey, we can do this to help you? It's been a mix. So there's some people that we've approached and then there's some folks that like saw our stuff and then approached us. So it kind of goes both ways. So um, and, and uh, another thing that kind of came out of Zoom becoming more regular and more normal is like, uh, Bill and I have made a point of trying to reach out to folks being like, hey, would you do a short Zoom call with us? Um, and even if it doesn't necessarily lead to us working with someone, we, we we try to make sure that we keep trying to expand our network of folks so that we can see who else we, we can partnership. So we try to keep That's up with all that. this business is about. It's a relationship business. I mean, everyone mm-hmm. tends to forget that you know, this is down to just relationships, just like any other business. So that makes sense. So if no one, maybe they might say no to you now, it doesn't mean no forever. It might be just no for now, but later on they'll be like, oh yeah, I need to think of more Kindle because he can do this, you know, Mm -hmm. or it's later on. That's great. That's amazing. Do you feel like um, now that you've kind of stepped more away from um, the, the, stand up in some of the improv just because we haven't had the opportunity to do it as much do or do you still feel like you have the drive to go back to it or do you feel like you're just going in a whole new direction now and you're gonna leave those draining moments that you had written on your piece of paper behind and go for the next evolution of your career um i definitely like to go back to performance like i mean i've started to dip my toe back in so like uh where i'm at right so you know how we've gone through like these ups and downs so there was a period last summer where, you know, I was fully vaccinated and we had like a brief green light to like do what you want, you know? And so during those moments, I did go back to like doing stand up and things. And then numbers kind of started to go back up. And so currently I'm in a place where I'm mostly only doing like outdoor shows um, and not, and I'm not really like seeking them out. So it's kind of like, there are a couple folks that I feel comfortable with where it's like if they ask me to do an outdoor show I'll be like sure but other than that I'm not really like trying to get out there and with stand-up or at least the way that I approach uh stand-up excuse me (coughs) pardon me uh at least the way that I approach stand-up is like you kind of gotta do it a lot you kind of have to do it all the time so that you're writing and developing and like being able to be in that moment when yeah because it's like if they you're not there people forget about you so it's very like you have to be there all the time, right? 
Oh, well, even just from like um, a practice point of view, where it's just like, if it's something that you're only doing, uh, th that's definitely a great point. But in also in addition to that, um, just from a practice point of view, just having that timing, it's tougher to build that timing, at least for me, if I'm not doing it as much as I can. So, which is where I'm at currently, where I'm like sporadically doing it. So it's tougher to try new stuff or, you know. Um, so when I, so I, it's not like I'm not doing it at all. I'm just not doing it as much. Uh, I hope that, you know, as time progresses, I will get back to where I am doing it a lot. But I, I do think that my relationship with um, live performance has like fundamentally changed. And I don't think it'll ever really go back. Cause I mean, I think there was um, uh, before the, like the, the, you know, I've been on this wild break with not whatever stretch it was when things first locked down to um, whenever, you know, I got vaccinated and went back and did my show that, that, that break of not performing. And I imagine this is true for most comedians, but that's easily like the longest break I've ever taken from live performance since I started performing, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and, um, and yeah, I'm still, I guess kind of figuring out like what that what that means but um yeah you're, you're I think... talking earlier about the self-identity portion of it like if you can't mm -hmm. be on stage and you can't have your voice heard like mm -hmm. are you any less of a storyteller or does that completely validate you and that's the thing that i'm trying to let the listeners know that you are an actor you are a storyteller no matter what like no matter what kind of break you might have you still have a valid voice to be heard in this world. You need to be heard. You're brilliant. You're only one like you, Mark. There's no one else like you in this world. Oh, thank, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. And, and, and that break was actually like a really good learning experience. Cause I was like, you know, cause when I went back to stand up, I was just like, oh, like I'm rusty in some ways, but it's like, I'm also better in some ways. It's not like this break was, it's not like it ruined me as a performer or, or anything like that. I think I came back with like new points of views on things. Like I looked at it differently and I'm like, oh man, I never would have, you know, taken this break uh, like willingly or intentionally or anything like that, but I did and it was fine. And so for so long, part of the reasons that I would like do so many shows, it's like, I have to, because if I, you know, if I go a week without performing, it all like goes away, you know, like, which now sounds silly, but you know, beforehand, like, I really, really thought that I'm like, I can't go a week without performing. I, I could never do that. And then taking, like, the extended break that I did and seeing, like, oh, like, the skills are still there. They don't, they don't, it just, it doesn't just go away, you know? And um, learning that was very comforting. And so, like, I think um, the need to perform or, like, the, um, that, I don't know, whatever that, 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 um, itch. that motor, what, that itch, yeah. It's like, I still want to perform, but it's not, it doesn't come from that same place anymore. And, and it's not like, and I'm not saying it's like good or bad, but, but it, but it has changed into something. No, I think yeah. it's good. You know why? Because you're more comfortable and you're more mature in your skills now. And you don't have to like have anything validate you. You can just be validating for yourself, which is so important. And that's what I wanted the listener to also get that you as a storyteller are validated in just being who you are, that you have a story to tell and whether it's taking a break because, you know, you had a kid, I had twins, I had to take a break for a while. And when I came back, it was kind of like starting all over again and, and people had to get to know me again. And um, yeah, it, it, and I, I had to wrestle with that in my mind. I'm like, oh, am I just trying to be this or am I this? And what, what's the real truth and just finding that truth in your mind. And I feel like as I've grown older, I've been more secure and sometimes less secure in my voice, but trying to get more into the secure spot that I have something to say, I have a message and that message is okay to be told now. And I feel like that's so wonderful that you kind of went through that too. And now your comedy can evolve and is just so much more in a, um, a, a beautiful space of like teaching too. Oh, thank you. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent, Mark. Wow. This has been really amazing to be able to just connect with you and just hang out and yeah. see where your story process is going. If you could tell your 20 year old self 
one piece of advice, what would it be? I know you've probably heard people ask you this before. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess like the practical advice would be like, go find Bill Worley much earlier. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, other than that though, I'd say like, um, just kind of keep do like, it's just keep doing what you're doing. I think, I think I had like an inferiority complex, like 20 years ago or like earlier coming up with comedy in Atlanta, just cause Atlanta's comedy scene. I mean, it gets more props now, but before, like when I first started here, it, it didn't. And, um, I don't know. I just kind of felt like, um, like maybe a lot of the work that I was doing here was less than cause it wasn't in New York or LA or in Chicago where more people would just talk about those comedy scenes. And I didn't realize that um, while, you know, while I was coming up through those years of doing like improv or stand up or the sketch that I was doing, whatever, it may not have gotten as much attention like as my peers on the coast had. On the flip side, and, and there were, you know, costs to that, like, but on the flip side, it's just like, you know, coming the 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 benefit of coming from like someplace different is that like you sound different you know your your point of view is different and that you know can be really valuable as well and i uh if i were talking to someone from before it's just like i don't know i, I think like i, I realize it's maybe longer than i meant for it to be but but like uh talking to someone younger i think there's may, maybe don't get so stressed about the right way of doing something and instead just kind of focus on like just be messy and fun with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be messy and fun with it and find Bill Worley. I think those are the kind of like the main things that I'd say. I yeah. need to apparently meet Bill Worley. <laughs> you do, yeah. Bill Bill's great. Yeah. I think um Bill's Bill's really great. I I uh uh he he's like a super talented filmmaker. If you need a director, like you should definitely hire him. But he's such a unique, like hybrid creative force and that like performance he understands directing he understands shooting he understands editing he understands sound he understands and so like he's like this one person crew but you know his ability to collaborate you know has uh you know been really really amazing so and on the flip side of that if you could go forward about 20 years into the future what would you tell to yourself then you know looking back oh on yeah um oh that's a great question what would I tell myself 20 years from now um uh what would I say I guess um I have a feeling I know you're going to come from a place of gratitude you seem like a oh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah yeah I mean I mean uh yeah I mean I I, I mean yeah I don't know I don't know what I don't know what I I don't know what I would I don't know what I'd say. I guess I'd, I'd have more questions, you know, than like saying anything. I'd just, I'd just ask a bunch of questions like what's been happening, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. That's awesome, Mark. Mark, tell everyone where they can actually find you so that we can keep in touch with you and, um, you know, be able to see all your wonderful content that's coming up. Sure, yeah. So uh, the best way to follow me or keep up with whatever I'm doing is on social media. So. Uh, on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. I'm at Mark Kendall Comedy. I'm on Twitter as uh, at Kendall Comedy. And then um, Bill and I, we have a production company called Cuckoo Cool Productions. And a lot of our work uh, is using comedy to encourage different forms of civic engagement. You can visit our uh, website at coolcoolcoolpro.com. Excellent. And we'll have all the links in the show notes. Oh, fine. Thank you so much again, Mark. This has been amazing. I've learned so much from you and oh, great. I just really appreciate you. And I cannot wait to see what you have coming out next. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, you having me. I appreciate the time. Thanks for tuning in to Undetoured, Navigating the Artist's Journey. If you enjoyed this episode, please do me a favor and subscribe and leave a five-star review. And please check out our other episodes on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And in return, my gift to you is a short, invigorating meditation to get your day started. You can find its link, along with other links to Undetoured, in this episode's description. Undetoured, Navigating the Artist's Journey was produced by Cabot Basden of Say What Sound Studio and hosted by Sloan Warren.